Good morning, everyone. Well, this is a bit of a change for me, a bit of a change for you, and neither of us knows quite what to expect. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, this morning, uh, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our minds be acceptable to you. Amen. Warren was given a, a little brief on what this sermon was going to consist of, and we're going to go somewhere that probably isn't visited that often, uh, because we're going to get through something like 68 verses, and that's why it's not visited very often. <laughs> so uh, I, I need you to stay with me and work quite hard. Let's start by remembering that about 4,000 years ago, the Lord was having a conversation with a friend of his. And he, that's the Lord, took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's Genesis 15:5. The Lord, of course, was speaking to Abraham, as he was then called. Now, Abraham would have seen something like that. Something like that. I'm kind of assuming that in God's um, arrangement of things, he arranged it to be uh, a, a moonless night with no clouds. Uh, I think that's reasonable, don't you? <laughs> so... Um, Away from the city lights, a totally dark sky, Abraham would have seen something like that. Virtually everything Abraham could see, that's about estimated, something like 2,000 stars, virtually everything he could see is in our own galaxy, which we call the Milky Way. It's that band starting in the middle and extending upwards at a slight angle. The Milky Way galaxy consists of something like 100,000 million stars. That's 100 billion stars. And, and although Abraham wouldn't have appreciated it, on the back of his retina was starlight from a good proportion of a hundred billion stars. <sighs> Let's make a guess. Let's say a fraction of them, because he's only looking in one direction, seeing part of the galaxy. Let's say he's seeing starlight from oh, 20 billion stars, okay? I was intrigued uh, by a few sums that I did. The current global population of planet Earth is 7.4 billion human beings, of which, according to Wikipedia, 2.2 billion are Christian. Okay, we won't argue with them this morning. Well, if 2.2 billion are Christian today, if we add on, I don't know, another 4 billion that have died and gone with the Lord in the past 2,000 years, if we add another 4 or 5 billion who are yet to come on this planet until he returns, we get a figure of about 10 billion. And we've just estimated that we think Abraham was seeing something like 20 billion stars. So the, the staggering thing is that actually in these huge numbers, it's in, it's in the same ballpark. It's not just a vast number too, too large to imagine. It's actually pretty well close as far as we can estimate. I think that's amazing. But this morning, I want to suggest that the stars of the night sky may be considered to be analogous to Abraham's offspring in another respect, other than sheer numbers. 
Let's have a look at this same. We haven't, we're not smart enough to get outside our own galaxy and take a real picture, but this is what our galaxy is imagined to be like if you've got a computer and you do a lot of sums. So that's looking at it face on. Edge on, it must look something like one of those top hat symbols. Okay. And we're about two thirds of the way out in between some, one of the spiral arms, some of them. And as we look around in the plane of the galaxy, we see that band extending. That's the plane of our galaxy. As we look out from the plane of our galaxy, we see relatively few stars. That's looking out towards you. Are you with me? So if you look, it's like a disk. If you look out of the disk, you see relatively few stars. If you look in the plane of the disk, you see that band of stars, which we call the Milky Way. Are you feeling small yet? <laughs> okay. Because we can't look at our own galaxy head on, I've got a photograph of one we can look at face on. Now this is the pinwheel galaxy, M101 NG 5457. Uh, it's 21 million light years away, and it kiss, consists of one trillion stars. I, I, I had a little bit of a, an experiment with the numbers. I was well, if somebody set out this morning to walk to the Pinwheel Galaxy, how long would it take them to get there? Uh, and it turns out that the length of time it will take them is about 50 times the age of the universe assuming you're an old earth creationist. <laughs> so it's something like 800 billion years. So uh, you better start now. If you... <laughs> that's, that's one with 12 zeros on the end of it uh, for the trillion and one with 1.2 with 20 zeros on the end of it for its distance from us. It's a long way away. Now I should also explain that most of the little points of light are not the pinwheel galaxy, there are galaxy stars, because we're looking through a thin layer of our galaxy stars to see the pinwheel galaxy beyond them, yes? So apart from the, hey, I've got a cursor, apart from this bit in the middle and these shadowy arms, all the points of light are actually stars in our own galaxy that we have to see through to see the pinwheel galaxy. Now that photograph was taken in June 2007. Here's a photograph of the same galaxy taken in August 2011, a few years later. Ta-ra! No? Okay. Let, let me go back. Yes? Well, obviously it's not framed identically and it's not focused identically, but it's something flashing on and off at you. Can you all see it? Actually, this alternating backwards and forwards between different frames is how the planet Pluto was discovered. I thought you'd like to know that. Okay. Here's my cursor. That is new. There's no cursor. I've got it on here. Okay. Let me help you out. Can you see the red mark? It's pointing on the right to a new source of light. I've thought of everything. There's the two alongside one another. It's that one there. We trust you, Tim. Do you see? You've got a little line of three stars, yeah. and on the second photograph, there's a fourth star in the middle, and and that that light source 
is almost as bright as the galactic core. Okay. That light source is, is in the pinwheel galaxy and it's shining with the radiance of a billion plus other stars. And it wasn't there a few years earlier. And a few years after this, it wasn't there again. So the star has briefly increased in brightness until it's briefly outshining a billion other stars. You know the name for it. It's gone supernova. I want to suggest to you this morning that every now and again, very occasionally, one of Abraham's children goes supernova and briefly, like this star, outshines a billion other saints in radiant brilliance before disappearing from view, never to be seen again. And my number one piece of evidence for this theory that occasionally Abraham's children go supernova is a man in the New Testament who went supernova, who briefly was more radiant and more brilliant than a billion other saints. And his name is Stephen. Joe's on the ball. <laughs> okay, this, 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 Stephen isn't preached on because the account runs to something like, as I said, 68 verses. And how do you cram that into a sermon? I'm going to try. Stephen first appears in the book of Acts when they had a problem. It was largely an administrative problem. And not all the widows were getting their distribution and they had to uh, elect some new church officials to sort out the, the problem. Uh, and they chose seven. And the first of the seven is Stephen. Uh, and Luke describes him in glowing terms. In fact, he heaps superlative upon superlative to describe the quality of this man. He's arrested. He's put on trial before the Sanhedrin. And there he delivers a speech that Luke records in chapter 7 of the book of Acts. We're going to try and get through the whole speech. It doesn't very easily cut up into sections. I want you to get the whole thing. On the one side you have Stephen, and on the other side the Sanhedrin. Let's separate the Sanhedrin into its two main components. There are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're working in an unholy alliance, not natural bedfellows, to oppose Stephen. Right, now I need some volunteers. Now, two volunteers are going to be good guys, bad guys. One volunteer is going to be a good guy. So, who wants to volunteer? This is for illustrative purposes. I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you. Please. If you would take one of the end seats. Someone else? Hey, Barry. And Warren, please. Uh, Warren, take an end seat. And Barry, if you take the center seat. So the three uh, elements in the drama that unfolds, from the left, Mr. Sadducee. <laughs> On the right, Mr. Pharisee. And sandwiched between them, our hero, Stephen. Stephen! Right. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so let me, let me fill you in on what these characters represent in terms of their thinking. So, if Mr. Sadducee, if you could stand. The, the, the best known Sadducee in, in our New Testament is... Caiaphas. Okay, so imagine Warren is Caiaphas this morning. Now, as a Sadducee, he sought to embrace Greek life and culture and to cooperate with Rome. Okay, thank you. <laughs> However, sit down. Mr. Pharisee, he sought complete separation from non Jewish elements. And he was particularly keen when it came to table fellowship. He really didn't want to sit down at the same table with those icky non-Jewish people. Thank you. However, Mr. Christian... Yay. You're doing well. He sought a, a critical embracing. He did engage with Greek and Roman culture, but it wasn't accepting it all on board, no questions asked. It was a critical interaction with the culture. Not separatist, not assimilation, but a mid-course between the two. Thank you. The Sadducee, they stressed human free will. They were essentially deists. They believed that God got this universe created and going, and then pretty much it was down to human free will as to how it proceeded. So they didn't expect to see God very active in day-to-day -day lives. They thought that was all about... What are you laughing at? <laughs> all about... Okay, okay, sit down. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pharisee, however, he was a God's sovereignty person. He saw himself in complete opposition to the Sadducee. God controlled everything, <laughs> determined everything according to his plan. And human free will, well, that, what was that? That didn't really figure in his thinking. It's all God's doing. Thank you. The Christian... didn't see a conflict between these two ideas, said that both could exist alongside one another and embraced both free will and God's sovereignty. In, it is tricky to understand, but the Christian embraces both. Says you don't need to choose. Both are true. Thank you. Mr. Sadducee, he revered the law of Moses, and not much else, to be quite honest. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pharisee, he reveres the law of Moses. That's the first five books of our Old Testament. He reveres the prophets. He reveres the writings, and he also re reveres the oral tradition. This is a, a bunch of uh, ideas that they claim, the Pharisees claim, have been passed on orally from Moses. Thank you. The Christian re revered the whole of the Old Testament. So that's the law, the prophets, and the writings. It's, it's interpreted through a Christological lens, so it's not identical to how uh, people before Christ interpreted it. But he didn't go much on that oral law stuff. He rejected that stuff that the Pharisees held on to. Thank you. <laughs> They're going for an Oscar, aren't they? <laughs> Caiaphas the Sadducee, his real focus was <laughs> the sacrificial system and temple worship. That was their <clears throat> number one thing. Thank you. The Pharisees' number one thing 
was tithing and, <laughs> and all sorts of laws about how you wash your hands and stuff like that. You would not believe the complexity and the length they went to. And you had to do this before you put any food in your mouth or you weren't clean. Probably called health and hygiene. <laughs> it went way beyond health and hygiene. <laughs> The Christian, recognising that the temple worship stuff was about externals and the washing and the tithing is also about externals, he stresses internals. He stresses love. Thank you. Probably the most characteristic uh, um, position that the Sadducee took was no resurrection. And therefore, no final judgment. No resurrection, no judgment. Thank you. Mr. Pharisee, he did hold to a resurrection, but it was a resurrection of an untransformed body. So you just got resurrected in the same body that you died in. Thank you. The Christian, however, holds to the position that the res come the resurrection, you're resurrected in a transformed body. A body fit for heaven. <laughs> right. Thank you. Can you take your seats in the front and I'll borrow you again later. Thank you. Look, looking for a word to s summarize the Sadducee position, and admittedly, if I'm restricting myself to one word, obviously there are limitations on that, but if I'm going to give them a, a one-word label, it would be materialist. And the same approach with the Pharisees, if I'm giving them a one-word label, it would be legalists. Okay? And whilst... You don't see too many Pharisees and Sadducees walking around today. Materialism and legalism are everywhere. So although those characters aren't around, the, the world view that they held is very much in our faces every day of the week. So I've got a question for you. I'm gonna, I know you're comfortable with this because you do it for David all the time. <laughs> so the question is, what does a materialist today, what sort of attitudes and behaviours does he exhibit? A materialist. He doesn't believe in anything beyond what you can experience with your senses. He thinks when you die, that's it. Game over, whatever. Finished. What does materialist attitude and behaviour look like today? They're the people that... Ooh, I'll turn it on this time. There you go. They're the people that want to get to the top of their profession. They want to have the best car, you know, the best clothes, whatever. Right. Thank you. Somebody else? Oh. You know, they're absolutely right. You always pick people at opposite <laughs> end in sequence. I know when the next one's going to come from. It's all about me. Everything about is about me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyone else want to say something? Yeah. They want to live in the moment and enjoy themselves because as far as they're concerned, that's the only life they have. Absolutely. You've got someone there? I'm the centre of the universe. Yes. We, we knew that, Louis. <laughs> Also, if, if they're denying a final judgment, they're saying that God is not just. Because every now and again, somebody behaves abominably all their lives and dies in the lap of luxury surrounded by their family. 
And according to the Sadducee, that's it. They got away with it. The fact that there are people like that in the world proves a final judgment if God is just. If there's no final judgment, God is not just. It's that serious. You probably guess what the next question is going to be. So, Mr. Pharisee, Mr. Legalist, what sort of attitude and behavior does he produce in the 21st century? Joe. Someone who's judgmental of other people and their actions. Okay. Someone for whom tradition is everything. Okay. Rules and regulations that are more about rules and regulation than the people. Okay, thank you. If you're not doing it my way, you're not doing it right. Uh -huh. It's worth noticing that if... Sorry, did I ignore you? <laughs> that, that, that would be a mistake. <laughs> Someone who uh, Timmy calls the Sunday Sunday Christian. Uh -huh. <laughs> I do get to eat lunch today. <laughs> if, if I had allowed myself a second word to describe the Pharisee, I'd use the word separatist. They, they withdraw from people that they don't consider quite up to their standards. They regard others who don't meet their standards as lesser. Both the materialist and the legalist are all around us all the time. And their influence potentially pollutes our thinking. When we listen to that pollution, and when we adopt attitudes and behaviours of the materialist or the legalist, then, let me speak in these terms, it's like a little Sadducee is born inside us or a little Pharisee is born inside us, there to try and snuff out the life of God. Because that's what they did. They literally snuffed out the life of God. A Sadducee or a Pharisee are both redeemable. But materialism and legalism are not the only thing to be done with them is to execute them. Okay, let's, oh, let's go to the speech. I'm going to overrun, you know that. Oh dear. Chapter 7 of Acts. The high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God did promise that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, For 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And God said, And afterwards they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. 
Because, of the patri because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On the second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. I'm breaking this long speech down into sections. This is the first section. It concerns Abraham and Joseph. I find it quite interesting that Stephen doesn't make an obvious point here. He could be saying... These guys were around before the law, before the tabernacle, before the temple, and we regard them as figures of renown. So it was always possible to please God quite apart from all those things. He doesn't make that point. I kind of think they were expecting him to make that point. The fact that he doesn't alerts us that even though he's accused of speaking against the temple and the law, his speech has nothing to do with what he's being accused of. He's going off in a quite different direction. He establishes the principle that God punishes those who enslave and ill-treat Israel and oppose God's purposes. Who is who is enslaving and ill-treating Israel in the first century apart from the Romans? It's the Sanhedrin. It's the leadership. And they're most certainly opposing God's purposes. They put our saviour to death on a cross. The patriarchs oppressed, just short of murder, God's anointed one in Joseph. God rescued him, equipped him, promoted him, and he's promoted to the right hand of Pharaoh, to the Egyptian Pharaoh's God. Joseph is prom promoted to the right hand of God. Does that remind you of anyone? Absolutely. It, pre it prefigures Jesus being promoted to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Joseph then becomes the means of salvation from famine in the Genesis case, but he becomes the means of salvation for his family. And the patriarchs, those who almost murdered Joseph, but for the intervention of Reuben and Judah, they almost murdered Joseph, they die in exile. That's an important picture. That's separated from the promised land, separated from the pre presence of God. That's the picture in this account of Abraham and Joseph. <clears throat> Stephen is establishing parallels between the, his present and the past and the characters in the past and ultimately will draw conclusions. The Jews of the first century very much regarded themselves as being in continuity with previous generations. These, these Sadducees and Pharisees, they were the, the sons of the patriarchs. And in Jewish thinking, son means more than biological descendant. It means having the same character. And what Stephen is showing them, that character is murderous and rebellious. It's not a message they wanted to hear. Verse 17. 
As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased, had greatly increased. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. But when he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own, own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being ill-treated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, men, your brothers, why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was ill-treating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they'd rejected with the words, who made you judge and ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself. Through the angel who appeared to him in the bush, he led them out of Egypt. Sorry and performed wonders and signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him, Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings for 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I send you into exile beyond Babylon. Moses, as a baby, is almost murdered. He attempts to murder him by the new Pharaoh but God promotes him to become the means of salvation for Israel. Do you see the type? Do you see who he's really talking about? Moses is rejected by the two fighting Israelites and fled. But God sends him back to liberate them. He's not talking about Moses. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the prophet that is a prophet like Moses, rejected but redeeming. Moses is rejected in the golden calf incident. And as a consequence, God first rejects them by giving them over into idolatry, and he then exiles them. And again, exile stands for exclusion from the presence of God from the promises. It's a picture of hell.
verse 44. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It has been made as God directed Moses, according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favour and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? The tabernacle and the temple, they're not the reality. They're a pattern and a representation of the reality, not the reality itself. You've probably got a photograph of a loved one at home sitting on a mantelpiece or on a wall. And maybe you glance at it every now and again and it makes you smile. But you don't glance at it when they're there visiting you. Why would you? You don't need the representation when you have the reality. That was the truth that Stephen had grasped and was telling them. The temple had become redundant as a means of getting to God. The temple was a statement that God was with them. They now had the Holy Spirit inside them telling them that. The tabernacle is a picture of a single way of getting to God. Via sacrifice and washing, via a menorah of light, symbolizing the activity of the Holy Spirit, via bread of the presence, an altar of incense. Oh, it's a sermon in itself, but it's picturing Jesus' ministry, what he achieved on Calvary. Now that he's achieved all of that, you don't need the picture of it. You've got the reality. The climax to Stephen's speech, verse 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. That would have hurt. You're just like your ancestors. He's just listed all their failings. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? The answer is no. They've even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. I'm not sure I need to say anything about that. I think it's all pretty straight, isn't it? Bearing in mind all that he's just shown them, he's just accused them and demonstrated by their own history that they are rebellious murders. The Sanhedrin don't really reply to these accusations except to execute him. Which I interpret as being a, an admission of guilt. They're accused of being rebels and murders, murderers and they take another anointed one of God and they murder him. So is that it? The, the 2D, two-dimensional interpretation of this passage. Stephen is condemned and executed with the Sanhedrin acting as judge, jury and executioner. That's being kind, they're really a lynch mob. It, is, is, is Luke telling you the story of a further miscarriage of justice pretty much like Jesus's some time before? Does this, this account certainly does represent the final decisive breach 
between the Christians and the religious establishment of first century Israel. And thereafter, God turns to the Gentiles. The gospel is first for the Jews. They reject it. He turns to the Gentiles. But the question is, is that it? Is that the story that Luke is trying to tell us? You might consider that when uh, John is telling the story that they're going to treat his disciples the same way as they treated Jesus, he takes one verse to do it. Matthew takes about three to say the same sort of thing. Are we really to believe that Luke is going to take 68 verses just to say he's going to treat us the same, that the world is going to treat us the same way that it treated Jesus? Or is there more? I think there's more. I think there's a lot more. Three things to consider. The tone. Stephen is not defending himself. He says nothing about the charges against him. It's not a defense. It's an offense. He's in the faces of the Sanhedrin. He's not defending himself at all. You look at the envelope. That's the bit that goes around the speech. If, if, the, if the speech was a letter, this would be the envelope. Stephen is described in glowing terms. He's full of faith, grace, power, wisdom, and the Holy Spirit. He's also visibly radiant with the Shekinah glory of God. Face of an angel. Uh, incidentally, if you're in argument with somebody who's visibly radiant, just put your hands in the air and say sorry. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> At the end, Stephen sees Jesus, and Jesus is standing. When Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected to the right hand of the Father, where he sat down, indicating he had completed the work. Here he's standing. He's getting ready to do something. Jesus stands, ready to judge. Consider the wider context. We believe in a God of justice. And justice has four elements. The vindication and consolation of the innocent. The condemnation and punishment of the wicked. Jesus' resurrection is his vindication. He's been raised to the right hand of the Father, which is a substantial consolation. And every extension of the kingdom since that day is a further consolation. But what of the condemnation and punishment of his murderers? This is the three-dimensional interpretation. This is the interpretation that takes into account a vertical dimension. So if we could have our three gentlemen back. Right, so we saw our Christian, okay, if you could stand here, hands in front of you, as though you're tied in the dock, you're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Caiaphas is probably presiding, so he's in the center, back a little, folded arms, frowning, I kind of imagine. And our Pharisee, well, he's like, we're going to make him prosecuting counsel, so we'll have him standing and he's raising a, a pointing finger. <laughs> this is the two-dimensional interpretation of what's happening. Caiaphas overseeing the prosecution of this Christian. But as we've just seen, I don't think it's right. I don't think that's the story Luke is telling at all. Because Stephen is not defending. The Shekinah glory to any sane person makes him innocent before he's opened his mouth. He's not defending. And actually, 
Caiaphas, not over, Caiaphas is not overseeing things. Jesus is overseeing things because he was seen at the right hand of the Father, standing up. Actually, if Warren, you could stand here alongside. It's these two that are in the dock, okay? So folded hands, okay? Get rid of that. And you can raise the finger at them. <laughs> It's the Sanhedrin that's on trial here. Stephen is prosecuting. That's why his speech is so in your face and aggressive. He's prosecuting and overseeing it all. Uh, this isn't working. Oh, well. I did have a, a, a representation of Jesus overseeing this proceeding. In the real world, Jesus is overseeing Stephen's prosecution of the Sanhedrin for rebellion and murder of the Son of God. And such is the vast scope of Stephen's endeavour, his sheer audacity in taking it on. I consider him to have gone supernova and for a brief time outshining a billion other saints. But there's more. Not much more. <laughs> <laughs> if Stephen is prosecuting, I think he is. If the Sanhedrin is on trial, I think it is. Once Stephen's speech is complete, no defence is offered other than stoning the prosecutor. Jesus stands ready to judge, but he doesn't actually pronounce a judgment. What is he waiting for? What would any judge be waiting for before he pronounces a judgment? He's waiting for a verdict. So, if you could um, leave, please. we done with you. Bye. Thank you. Jesus stands and he's waiting for a verdict. So, here is the question Where is the jury in this story? We've seen Sanhedrin, we've seen Stephen, we've seen Jesus, but where is the jury? Answer in your hearts, please. Whose responsibility is it to determine whether Stephen has proven his case and the Sanhedrin are guilty of rebellion and murder? Whose responsibility is it? Where is the jury? If you are confident you know the answer to that question, would you please stand? What do you think? What do you think? Is it a crowd? No, 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 no. If you're confident, stand. <laughs> no, I'm not confident. I'm not confident. I'm not confident. I'm not confident. <laughs> okay. Where is the jury? I'm looking at it. Whoever reads this account or hears it being read to them is responsible to God to make a judgment as to whether Stephen has proven his case. Whether he's proven beyond reasonable doubt that materialism and legalism are bankrupt. They destroy the life of God in people. They lead to violence, 
and murder. I'm going to ask you to give your verdict in a few minutes, but uh, I want need to caution you that if you are going to form the opinion that Stephen has proven his case, you cannot condemn materialism and legalism in the first century without condemning it in the 21st century. You can't condemn it there if you're not prepared to condemn it here. If your verdict is a guilty one, you are making a plea to Jesus to execute that little Sadducee and that little Pharisee that's got inside you when you took on board some of the lies of the world. Recognising that both materialism and legalism produce the fruit of violence and murder, not the righteousness that God desires. I've given you the caution, would you please stand? Would you extend your right hand to the front? Would you clench the fist and extend the thumb out into the center? Aha. Uh -huh. You know what I'm doing. So, before the, the congregated people of God and before God himself, you to make your decision known as to whether Stephen has proven his case and these things must die. I think they must die. Down. Is it? I was going to say Stephen's proven his case. But he has. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a verdict on the Sanhedrin. Yes. It's a verdict on legalism. It's a verdict on... So they must, of course they must die, yes. That was dying. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we have expressed in our actions today our conviction that these things are not acceptable, pleasing to you, and that they should not function in our lives. And we invite you, by your Holy Spirit, to destroy them utterly and help us to police our thinking to prevent these things slipping in to how we think and the way we behave. Lord, we want to live the life that you intend for us and not to be strangled by the poison of these false religions. Lord, do a work in us for your glory. In his name. Amen. Please be seated. One minute more. Stephen, as prosecuting counsel, indicts the entire religious establishment of first century history, first century Israel, for rebellion and murder. He also indicts materialism and legalism in every generation since then, even to the present day, even to here and now. It took him maybe 30 minutes in the first century to shine with a radiant brilliance that outshone a billion other saints. For me at least, I think I've witnessed a son of Abraham that has gone supernova. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.